So, thank you very much for coming to this session on a workload-centric workload workload -centric TCO view of cloud. Um, and I have so many esteemed guests here who we're going to introduce in a moment. Um, but I thought I'd give a bit of an overview of, of what we are seeing in terms of workload value, workload TCO in the cloud market at the moment. So I'm Owen Rogers, and I'm Research Director of the Digital Economics Unit at 451 Research. And essentially my job to come up with rules and understanding of when one cloud option is going to be better at value than another option. So I run a service called the Cloud Price Index, and the Cloud Price Index has around 30 benchmarks of cloud pricing around the world. Uh, we cover 90% of the global infrastructure as a service market, and we don't just cover public cloud compute and storage because getting that pricing is relatively easy. We also cover the typical cost of hosting a database. Uh, we cover the cost of OpenStack, VMware, and a bunch of other cloud options. And what this enables us to do is to come up with TCO options for when one cloud is better value for another. And a few months ago, we decided to investigate in depth the value of OpenStack against commercial offerings such as VMware and Microsoft and against the public cloud as well. And what emerged was probably not a surprise in that there's not really any clear standout leader. We can't say OpenStack is always better value in one place. We can't say that VMware is always cheaper either. The fact of the matter is it's a function depending on how well managed the cloud is, so it's labor efficiency, and how well utilized it is over time. So as a rule of thumb, if you have a manpower labor efficiency of under 400 virtual machines per engineer, you're probably better at the moment using a commercial platform. And the fact of the matter is, OpenStack engineers are really difficult to find at the moment, although hopefully this will increase with events like this. And because of that issue, at the moment, if you're running a small-scale cloud, you're not very efficiently managing it, you're probably better off controversially using something like VMware or Microsoft. But if you are very efficient at managing it, if you have a high level of utilization, OpenStack gets increasingly better value. And in fact, OpenStack gets more and more better value the greater scale it is operated at. Now, OpenStack distributions are often used as a method for reducing cost. And we actually found that OpenStack distributions pretty much write themselves in terms of value. So if you're using an OpenStack distribution, it is always, practically always, going to better value than using the OpenStack source over a long period of time. So there's loads of different nuances here, and I'm not going to go into all of them because that would take forever. But what this means for me is that to have just a single cloud platform for everything is a bit of a dangerous strategy. And I believe end users, consumers need to consider each different workload and work out where the best place to host it is. And obviously, this isn't just in terms of price and TCO. It's also in terms of security, in terms of geography. And increasingly, we're hearing from end users that a cloud-first strategy isn't now about going down a particular cloud route. It's about having the options of choosing different clouds. So my general advice I give to anyone is to consider a multi-cloud strategy rather than getting fully on board with only cloud provide, one cloud provider or one cloud option. And that is the basis of today's panel discussion. So I'd like to introduce the panel, starting from the left, please. All right, yeah. So my name's Scott Snedden. I'm with Juniper Networks. Um, I'm a senior director at Juniper focused on software-defined networking, virtualization, cloud technologies. Uh, my team um, looks across all of the go-to-market and sales efforts at Juniper, and we work with customers as well as with you know, Juniper people to kind of help understand uh, the challenges that customers have in, in moving to cloud, adopting these technologies. Uh, we spend a lot of time with telecom operators, helping them uh, look at and work around some of the challenges of NFE and virtualization and running their own cloud infrastructure. And, and you know, so we spend a lot of time business modeling a lot of the same sorts of things that you've talked about here and, and are in your research report, um, but also around the impact on the network and network operations. And so, you know, 
being a networking company, we kind of look at it from the view of how does automating your processes around managing network infrastructure help with that? And then culturally, how do you evolve your teams mm -hmm. so that the cloud and DevOps teams are working with the networking teams and that sort of becomes one consistent workflow. And we think that there's a lot of optimization that can happen there. Um, we'd love to talk to you a little bit more as you Anytime. continue your research about a, um, you know, how network operational practices impact um, these economics that, that you're calculating around cloud utilization. So. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Dimitriou. I'm a co-founder and uh, head of product of Midocura. And uh, what we do is we, we make an SDN solution for network virtualization for OpenStack and, and other platforms, primarily based on Linux. So um, our customers are actually in the enterprise space with a few companies in the, in the hosting space, not really any telecom um, as such. So um, being in the, in the network uh, virtualization area, one of the things that we attempt to do is to reduce the cost of network operations, you know, obviously for, for the cloud at least, at least for that. And we actually might be moving into, into other network areas as well over time. Thank you. I'm Chris Lindgren. I'm a senior Linux systems engineer with GoDaddy. I am on our OpenStack team, one of the founding members of our team. Uh, we operate eight uh, public and private clouds for, well, in four different regions. Um, pretty much in charge of everything on our OpenStack infrastructure. So uh, anything from deploying new services to spinning up new capacity to choosing flavor sizes, uh, uh, qualifying new images, making sure they conform to uh, security standards, uh, pretty much everything that deals with OpenStack at GoDaddy. Great, thank you. So I realize it's quite controversial me coming here to an OpenStack summit and saying OpenStack isn't the lowest TCO option for everything. Do you guys find that in your, in your working life? Do you think this multi-cloud ideal I'm talking about is something end users want, or is it just some analysts sprouting numerical research? Uh, I'm, for my view, what, and what we see at Juniper is, is exactly that, that um, you know, we'll get called in, especially when in, we talk about Contrail and the SDN solution that we have, which right. is quite OpenStack focused, a lot like Dan and, and Midokura but also supporting multiple cloud systems. And so, you know, we'll get in with a customer because they say, hey, we want to go OpenStack and, you know, we want all of these benefits and how can we make the networking work better there? But as we go down that path of working with them, they start to realize, gee, that VMware environment that they had installed that they'd love to bail on, maybe they can't. Maybe mm, there's some yeah. things that still need to live there. And come to find out there's a development team off in the corner that's using Amazon really, really heavily. And as much as they want to pull that in-house, there are things that exist in Amazon and that ecosystem that they're somewhat tied to. And so the reality is, um, at least for the foreseeable future, most customers that we talk to, especially in large enterprise, are going to have a multi-cloud strategy mm. for the foreseeable future. And, and so then what we get into is, is trying to help them figure out how to operate in these mixed environments a little bit better. Um, you, know, it, you know, we try to guide them on the best path towards the most economic solution. But, but the reality is different applications, different mm -hmm. teams, different cultures fit in different, different ways. Do you see the same, Dan? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I'm actually curious about the GoDaddy. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, we, we do use multiple clouds. So we do OpenStack. We have some teams. Uh, that we may have acquired that were already on AWS, they still have some workloads on AWS. Um, we also, when we make an investment in a region where we put a data center down, we'll put OpenStack in there, but um, there may be some regions where we want to put a presence, but we don't actually want to put a full data center infrastructure there. So we'll, we've been looking at using other public clouds and doing workloads there. Great. Uh, so obviously, if there's any questions, um, put your hands up. And uh, there's a little microphone there, so if you'd just like to come up and ask, that's great too. Um, just a little tidbit of information I'll mention now, actually, is in our research, we found that OpenStack qualified engineers were earning, on average, $40,000 more than uh, VMware or Microsoft qualified engineers. So I would argue you've made a, a wise decision coming here. Um, 
most of the findings we had were because of the expense of labor in OpenStack. Um, and now there's certification programs and the like. Hopefully that will get better, but I can't see salaries getting, getting lower soon. So wise decision. So ultimately, we found that private clouds that have a, a high labor efficiency, so that are very well managed, and private clouds at a high level of utilization can actually beat public cloud on cost. Um, and I was at a panel yesterday with some enterprise end users, and Walmart were there, there were these huge banks, and they were saying they were achieving the level of scale necessary to actually beat public cloud on price. Mm -hmm. But obviously, doing this in practice is, is hard work, and, and I would argue you need some kind of tools to actually increase the utilization, improve capacity planning, and to have the tools to be able to automate things. Is that something you see? Do you think the tools are, are critical? Um, so we work with, um, actually, a relevant question. So I think that the, one of the uh, inhibitors of OpenStack, especially among small, medium enterprises that will never have enough OpenStack skilled engineers, mm. uh, that's, that's, a, that's a huge factor. And, uh, and so some companies are attempting to address that. Like we work with Platform 9, you know, which is basically doing the a much more integrated automation of the whole experience, OpenStack, storage, networking. I think that would be critical to go in more, uh, more broad into the enterprise space. Chris, what do you see? Uh, I mean, yeah, tools are definitely a problem. From my point of view, it's managing a large fleet of servers. So we have a large number of servers and a bunch of internal network security zones. And um, mainly our problem is trying to there's other teams that are involved setting up some of the network and some of the other things and they miss things because they mm. do not have things automated. So we have a bunch of tooling on our end to double check other people's work. Um, but for our end users, I think the biggest problem is they have legacy applications and they've been on either bare metal or they've been on VMware where the, the method of operation at that time was make the infrastructure the VM runs on or the physical server itself highly redundant. And we're moving more to make the application highly redundant, handle failures and stuff in the application, um, exposing fault domains out through like availability zones and telling customers to split their app between availability zones so we can do uh, better forms of maintenance, um, we can do a better job of letting them create applications that are more fault tolerant to certain issues. Um, and that requires a large amount of philosophical change on their end. And that I think is the hardest part for us is just kind of keep on preaching the, your VM maybe is very important to you, mm. but from our point of view, it's one of a couple tens of thousands of them. So if we have a hypervisor that goes down, we're not doing backups on it. We're not like your data, your job to keep your, your backup of your data. Like, I don't know what's in your VM. So you need to be the one to make sure that your data is protected because when we lose that hypervisor due to a disk failure or RAID failure, or some, something, I don't have a backup of it. I'm not, I don't, I can't restore it for you. So it's your job to make sure that you're protecting yourself. So that, that's really interesting. So just to pick up on that, every time I see a, a report in the media about a cloud prov provider having downtime and all these enterprises and end users are, are unhappy with the situation, I constantly think, well, they did tell you that it wasn't 100% available and all the tools are there for you to build resilience and there's multiple availability zones, but you didn't actually take that advice. Do you think this is more of a, a cultural change then? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We, we tell people we're gonna do maintenance and availability zone a week in advance, and then we'll have at least four or five complaints about taking down a server in the middle of the day or mm. at night or something like that because they didn't, they didn't handle the failover or something like that. But we gave them a large window for them to figure out how they want to handle that maintenance. So they had, I mean, it, it's cloud, so you have capacity on demand. We highly recommend that people automate the workflows. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I'm, I'm going to hate on some Windows people here for a second, but uh, 
most of our Windows teams do not have good automation around spinning up an application or a server. They're, they don't do a really good job of doing that. So they typically run through like a documentation or a workbook or they uh -huh. try to make one server look like another server by going through settings and things like that and that's, it, you, you can't do that. It's just from a scale and turn up scale, it, it just doesn't work, so. Cool. I mean, this is a really good point. If you attend Amazon's big conference re-event in Las Vegas next month, what you'll see on their agenda is a handful of classes on how to use Amazon and use their tools and their APIs. But the majority of their sessions are just teaching their customers how to build yeah. what look more like cloud native applications and how to build around what's inevitably going to fail in a, at best, two or three nines environment. It's not five nines anymore. And, and I think we as an OpenStack community could probably do a better job teaching users and teaching at this summit mm -hmm. a little bit more about application architectures for these clouds because the assumption and the approach that we're just going to be able to bring everything into OpenStack that used to run on VMware or bare metal probably isn't the best approach. And, and we really need to help our users of these clouds evolve to cloud native. So it sounds like you're saying there's a skills gap, not only in, in OpenStack particularly, but just cloud in general. I, yeah, I would agree with that, that most certainly. And um, do you think the industry is resolving that? It, slowly but surely. I mean, we see more and more providers that are starting to develop that way. Um, one of the side effects that we see of the, the container buzz is mm. that people are starting to think about refactoring applications to run there instead of, it, when we moved to VMs, it was just take that thing and package it into, into another thing but containers doesn't really fit that model very clearly. And so, yeah, the container movement is really, I think, driving a lot of people to rethink application architectures also. Yeah, it, especially people who deploy, f from my experience on Kubernetes, because it, it forces you to already break your application into those chunks. Well, just a bit of a deviation then. So do you think containers are the death of virtual machines? You know, let's say five years' time. I, I keep falling back, and these guys from Juniper have heard me say this a bunch of times. So I, I sat on a software-defined data center panel about three years ago at an event in Silicon Valley, um, and next to me was a guy from UBS, big banking firm. And all morning we had been talking cloud native and the legacy has to go away and software defined is the future. And he chimed in on that panel and says, all you guys have been saying legacy this, legacy that. In the banking world, we call that shit that works. Right. <laughs> and right. frankly, there are a lot of mainframe type things that haven't gone away. And you know, we all hope they would, but there's mm -hmm. still a guy out there maintaining COBOL code somewhere. And I think VMware continues. Virtual machines have a place and will have a place for the foreseeable future. Containers are a really great way forward, and maybe we start to see VMs taper, just like we've seen mainframes taper significantly, mm -hmm. but they don't go away. It never dies, I, I, is my opinion. Do you see the same, Dan? Yeah, it, yes, and it occurs to me that what becomes really complex in that environment is networking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so, uh, self-serving uh, buzz here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Containers worth the hype? Uh, yeah. Yes and no. Um, I don't. I don't think you're ever going to replace, completely replace VMs. I mean, the from our inter, from our side, VMs are supposed to replace bare metal, but we have a huge interest in Ironic, and there's mm. a number of companies out there who have a huge interest in Ironic. I think what people really want more than anything is, I think what people want out of containers is that from an application standpoint, I just want to care about my code. I don't really want to care about the architecture or the infrastructure. And you give a bunch of software developers Kubernetes and they don't have to care so much about, like they define their pods and their services mm. and say like, here's the things I care about. Like here's the front end things that I want you to keep running. And it takes care of keeping everything running. but. Uh, I think that's what I see from our development teams that they want, but anything else you're giving them kind of a level of complexity, they don't really, they don't really, they own it right now, but they don't want it. 
Yeah, it's levels of, of abstraction. And, yeah. and automation is how you start to get there. And Kubernetes and, and these container ecosystems are another way to automate application deployment in a simpler fashion where the developer or the user doesn't have to understand the infrastructure. VMs were a level of abstraction that kind of took that away. And then, you know, self-serving again, Dan and I are very focused on how the network automates and exists in that environment. So just like a VM lets you not worry so much about the infra and, and a container lets you worry less, the network has to be pulled along with that. So the architectures of the network are represented in an abstracted way so mm -hmm. that you don't have to worry about topology so much as just the application framework that, that gets deployed and the network follows that appropriately with security policy, with connectivity mm -hmm. models automatically created to go along with that. I actually have a question for, for the moderator. You know. Uh, about containers, uh, have you done any cost modeling of that, you know, relative to the other platforms? So funnily enough, I have. So um, the problem with being an economist in cloud is the answer is never simple, and people like simple answers. But I, I did actually do a, an algebraic comparison of uh, of using virtualization against uh, containers, and what I actually found was that containers are in terms in terms of server efficiency, containers are always better or equal to virtual machines. And the thing that most impacts the benefit of using containers over virtual machines is the size of the operating system footprint. So essentially, if you squeeze, let's say you've got a server with eight virtual machines. If you were to replace those eight virtual machines with eight containers, containers would use less space and would better utilize the server than if you were using virtual machines. But actually what matters more is how big is the repeatable operating system footprint. So let's say our virtual machine was 50% Linux footprint, just for the sake of it. The greater that footprint, the greater the savings achievable. And we did a scenario of, I think it was 16, 16 containers versus 16 VMs, and it was like a 50% cost reduction relative to virtual machines. The primary driver was the, it's almost like the, the sharing of resources. So obviously in, in hardware virtualization, you're, you're sharing hardware resources, right? But when you have operating system virtualization, which is in many ways what, what containers are, to be simplistic, then you're sharing the operating system resources so you don't have to repeat them, and the hardware resources. Uh, it was a very theoretical um, approach but I, I generally think that theory is where the practicality begins. And if we see that opportunity in theory, then in practicality, I think we're, we're going to see savings of at least something. <laughs> great, great, what's the time? <laughs> uh, that gentleman had his hand up very quickly. Yeah, so the, the question is essentially, at what point do you see end users choosing value over cost, right? I, what's been interesting in the cloud price index for public cloud is because we have market share data and price data, we're able to measure commoditization of the market. So we're able to see, well, does having a cheaper virtual machine drive a greater market share? And actually what we found is being cheaper doesn't always mean you're going to win greater market share. So in public cloud at the moment, I'll start on public cloud, I don't think end users are particularly price sensitive. And I think the reason is, if I was a CIO and I had been using something, I had been on premises, I hadn't taken any risks, I was fairly secure in my job, 
I'm not going to pick up and move everything that my job relies on on something that's cheaper for a 10% saving, but then put my job under line. You know, so I think if you're a CIO, you obviously want to make cost savings, but you're not going to give up your security and reliability and all the responsibilities that come with that because something might blow up. With private cloud, I think you're right. I think it's a lot more difficult because the complexity of the solutions means that it is possible to pay more and get greater value. But then how do you measure how that value is going to contribute to the overall application? And this is the whole issue of price performance. It's easy to understand how much something costs, but then working out if you're getting value for that price is a different challenge. And, and I agree, it's not, not easy. Do you guys have the same views on that? So going back to what he said about the, the quality, and I think there's a, an assumption where if you go to a high-end storage architecture and stuff like that, you get much more reliability. And I've, I've had the exact opposite experience. Um, yeah. What you effectively do is you increase your blast radius for any sort of issue that you have. So you have a, a switch issue, um, you have a storage issue. It, instead of impacting 25, 30 VMs, now suddenly you've impacted 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. So you take a small problem and you make it really large. You also, with uh, network attached storage, from my experience, um, it, when you have a network issue specifically, you have a very short period of time, typically shorter than the, no the time it takes for the monitoring system to tell you that there's a problem to actually fix the problems. And when you have a bunch of VMs that are booted from volume uh, and the root disk is on uh, the SAN and the SAN network goes down, you've got about a minute and a half before that root volume becomes read only. And trying to, once you fix the networking problem and everything comes back up, now you have this VM that's sitting out there. It's got a corrupt disk. It's going to have to be f rebooted, file system checked. Someone's going to have to log in to the console with a password. The recovery time for that suddenly becomes hours. Where if you had something where you had a, like exposed fault domains and you built your app across three different commodity servers, if we had an issue with one server, you didn't just take down the entire application. Does that mean you, you don't use the SAN, you use local storage and rely on the application to take care of it? Right, we had a, uh, we had a public cloud product that was built on uh, five nine NetApps. So we had gold-plated NetApps that backed it up. Uh, we have more, the, 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 aside from reliable messaging, the, the second most unreliable thing in, our, in that infrastructure was the network connectivity to the NAS share or the, the NAS itself. So we, we specifically went from uh, shared storage to local disk. So back to you, the gentleman. Do you feel this is almost a, a culture issue that the client is still getting used to the cloud way of actually the, the hardware in some way is temporary and it can die. Do you think clients where you are working are actually a bit confused that it's almost the application that needs to be architected? So maybe from what Chris was saying, the, what really matters is how the application is going to be redundant rather than the expensive hardware. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we get that a lot. <laughs> I mean, I've been talking to telecom providers about 
this NFV sort of thing in Telco Cloud for, for three or four years now. And, and uh, you know, three years ago, there was a big push saying, okay, I'm gonna virtualize this thing that I used to run on a piece of network hardware, but I still need five nines and QoS and, you know, <laughs> high touch MPLS all the way down to that, that um, hypervisor. How do I get there? And, and, you know, how do I manage queuing on the network within the data center? And, you know, the conversations were always back and forth about, well, if you're going to build a data center and you're really going to virtualize these things, you, you kind of don't want to do that. I mean, we'd be happy to sell you a really high-end router with all those features to attach all your servers to, and, you know, geez, our stock would go through the roof. But you'd probably go out of business going doing that way. So, you know, there has to be a compromise. What we've seen more and more over the last couple of years, especially with all of the telcos getting involved in OpenStack, is a realization that maybe that's not the right approach to virtualize these networking things. And so, you know, that's been trickling out um, in, into more areas and people are, are, are really coming on board. Us in the networking industry are doing a lot to develop virtual network functions that follow this cloud native model a little bit more. Um, GPDK and SRLV and the things you have to do to get high speed IO sort of break some of those models. And, and so I think we've, the, the industry has to find the right balance for high speed IO and packet throughput versus distribution and, and, and cloud native architecture. And, and so it's an evolving thing for sure, but, but I think it's moving in the right direction. Great, so there were some other questions. Yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah, would you mind? You're close to Thank the mic. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, two, two second more. Uh, Make the recording. My name is Nathan. So my question was around the container speed that you gentlemen kind of touched upon at the beginning. Um, and we talk a lot about multi-cloud approach. Uh, with containers, it's become, with containers, and I'm using Docker and Kubernetes mm -hmm. specific, it's more architecting your application. Do you think that we're moving in a direction where we're abstracting away the underlying cloud? where it's not really a multi-cloud, it's more like a distributed container strategy, and it can be on any cloud irrespective. Like, is containers truly the holy grail, or is that something that you feel that we're moving in a direction towards? Thank you. I'm gonna check this over to you guys while I think about it. <laughs> I don't believe so. I think the architecture is very complex beyond just the compute, which is really what the container is. The storage, I don't think can be really abstracted like that. Like in, in your example for, you know, the application had to be rewritten to do its own distributed storage modeling, whatever that it, whatever it needs. And then you have a bunch of other external services, like you have external network access, you have DNS, you have all kinds of things, which uh, geographic distribution, I don't think can be hidden away for, for an application. Do you think it is? <laughs> yeah. it, there's a lot of tech that, that's being worked upon right now. There's SaaS and OpenStack mm -hmm. using file system as a service. Uh, yes, it's not where it needs to be today to work in, an, in, in even a triple nine kind of a setup, but I'm hoping that eventually that is what it would be, that the underlying, um, underlying um, cloud becomes a material, whether you're on AWS or you're on, or on Azure or on, on maybe a Rackspace cloud, Essentially, what you're doing is you're architecting your application and abstracting the underlying cloud away. Because in theory, that's what Cloud Foundry is to some degree, right? Right. I was just going to say, yeah, like, yeah. in theory, it, you can do the exact same thing with VMs without having to go to containers. You it, just don't just don't tie yourself to a certain provider's APIs, and that's one thing we've seen. Well, <laughs> I mean, you can do it with a Cloud Foundry um, or even from some point, you can also use Shade for to handle the differences between OpenStack clouds. But that's what we tell our, like, we try not to have people that go directly. So we have some people who want to write, like, bash scripts to go hit the OpenStack API. Mm. And it's like, please, please don't do that. Go go use a client that's native to whatever. So, so the counter argument there is the underlying factor is cost. Uh, we have, I've seen a lot of customers who have just complained that even the smallest version that companies are offering right now, which might make, which makes financial sense for them from a VM perspective, is still nowhere close to the utilization that they're looking for. Mm. And that's why containers provide them more elasticity in terms of their usage and makes it more cost effective for them. 
So, and that is why my, my question was around whether containers forms the truly that abstraction layer that allows you to like pull back and forth, uh, grow or contract and just pay by usage rather than, you have, yeah, I have a smaller setup with even 20 nodes, but I hardly use 10 at any given point in time. So why am I paying for the other 10? Well, the, the ultimate version of that granularity is the so-called serverless Lambda, right? Mm. But that's also the ultimate lock-in. So in that sense, uh, I think you got to pay for it one way or another in terms of complexity or poor utilization, you know, you know what I mean? So I, I had a conversation with Google last week um, about their, their cloud platform. And Google are always talking about how they're cheap and they're going to kick Amazon's backside and, you know, they're going to they're gonna become the cheapest. And I've never really seen evidence to, to back that up. But last week, they, they described to me their infrastructure is essentially all based on containers, right? So they argue that because all of their infrastructure services are based on containers, they can do exactly that. They can grow and shrink the containers, and because of that, they can pack more in. So all of Google's services for cloud are on these containers. And what that means is they can not only put more on a server, but then they can also spin up temporary services that only last a few seconds for things like indexing. So they are using containers in this highly utilized fashion. Whether it will give them an edge in being cheaper in the future, I, I can't be sure because I'm sure Amazon have got little tweaks like that as well that they don't discuss. But it was interesting that they fundamentally see this containers as key to achieving their optimization of cost. So some, maybe the, some hyperscalers are already doing that. And there was a company called Elastic Hosts and they were structuring their virtual machines in a, in a container fashion. So they were arguing, well, don't have, choose your size of virtual machine, just start consuming and we'll bill you on the CPU utilization, um, which I so thought sounded like a great concept. It, it sounded like they're just, uh, you know, oversubscribing, right? I agree, yeah. I, I think that is, is the risk because, yeah. great, they're metering on CPU and storage, but that doesn't necessarily mean the server is going to be more packly dense, does it? Any more questions? There were a few hands. This gent. Yeah, I was curious, in your analysis of the economics of containers, were you also accounting for the increase in personnel costs associated with competent mm -hmm. container managers and admins, that sort of uh, ancillary, well, not ancillary, but, you know, other silo of expenses? Fair question. So was, was manpower costs included in that calculation? No, it wasn't. So it was a very direct X to X, and it, it was on the back of, of an envelope. Um, do you think the skills in handling containers would be harder to get, and do you think the maintenance would be harder than virtual machines, for instance? So I live in San Francisco, so you can find container people, like everyone is hatching the <laughs> Mm -hmm. as well as the amount of, of just sheer talent that you need to successfully deploy talent, uh, deploy container infrastructure. So it might be interesting in the future for me to investigate if containers command a higher salary in the same way OpenStack does. I, and that's kind of the reason why I was thinking about that, because if OpenStack commands a premium, I would assume containers would also. Do you have a follow-up there? Oh, I think you're dealing with the shiny object Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, about containers yeah. in general. Well, yeah, I mean, just it's, it's, Google's been leveraging containers for over a decade. It's just that it's been relatively rather dwarfy and challenging to mm. do it. And it. It took Docker coming along trying to solve. The one thing I don't think was discussed enough is part of the factor is not just the very economics, it's is the CIO or IT management uh, looking to change the way they do application development, try and move the amount of time between you know, their release cycle. Mm -hmm. If they're trying to do that, they're not really worried too much, as much about their IT infrastructure costs as much as they're really trying to think, how am I going to move fast enough to keep the business leaders off my back? Yeah. I, I think uh, another thing that's going to be challenging uh, as part of this consideration is this, uh, you talk about multi-cloud, but 
part of that, I think, will come into the size of the organization. Mm -hmm. Because if the organization is big enough, you're going to get a discount on your VMware or Microsoft licensing just by starting to talk or having your, your OpenStack cup on the desk when the director <laughs> is right? And so you'll get part of your economic benefit just from you know, pulling the, the code open and showing the revolver. Uh, if, you're, if you have a big enough organization to make that investment in multi-cloud, again, you're probably doing it for a number of reasons, economics so I've got some interesting tidbits on the economics of, of multi-cloud. So essentially, so we, we what's the time? Oh, wow. <laughs> right, well, I'm going to have to wrap up. But my tidbit will be that we found that if you were to build a complicated application of database, compute, storage, blah, 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 and you were to use multiple cloud providers to deliver it, which I agree would be a, a nightmare, for that complicated application, you could make 74% saving on the cost of deploying on a single provider by using multiple providers to do it. But if the application is really simple, just compute and storage, you're better off shopping around for a cheaper provider rather than going to the uh, messing around with all the complexity of, of multiple things. Which is why most of the websites are on shared hosting providers where we pack them on to thousands of websites onto a single server. Because most of the people have some PHP app with mm. a database back end, and they just need it online for some amount of time. And you don't need a cloud provider, you don't need containers, you don't need. We might want to put your stuff in containers to provide better resource isolation from bad actors, but that 99% of the web is going to run on some shared server somewhere. Mm. Well, we've reached time, I'm afraid, although I feel this could go on for a, a while yet. So can we get a round of applause for the panelists, please? And thank you very much. And I, I think one of the key takeaways was the definition of uh, legacy IT architecture is it works. Yeah. yeah, yes. Yeah, and no one wants change too quickly if it's not going to work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.